So this is Nursing 622, Module 2 on Genetics and Genomics. And your objective is to determine the relationship between the genetics and genomics <clears throat> for health prevention screening, diagnostics, selection of treatment, and monitoring of the treatment effectiveness. Also, your ability to elicit a minimum of three generation of family health history and individuals who can benefit from information, testing, and assessment. So we look at genetics and the history of it and the structure of the DNA, the progress that has been made on genetic testing, and how important it is for us as clinicians and then further as educators, educators to keep up on genetic testing and look at those competencies that every disease has a genetic or a genomic component. And this is important because we're looking in primary care as disease prevention, the screening, the diagnosis, prognosis, disease monitoring. You know, we talk about those different disease processes and diagnosis that are more common in certain population based on race, based on family history. This is why it's so important. It is a non-modifiable risk factor. You cannot modify your genes. And I can't express that enough that this is not modifiable. So genetics play a role in a lot of causes of death when we look at their inter interactions between the shared genes, the behaviors, cultures, and environment, looking at cancer risk, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and furthermore, side effects of medications. You know, we look at ACE inhibitors with angioedema and is a higher incidence in African-American population. <clears throat> we know that this is genetic. You can't change your genes. The social construct is significant with gender. It varies across all different cultures. And again, you have to look at that sex determination and differentiation, especially when you're looking at risk factors on what is that biological gender your patient was born with. Looking at the family health history, you take a health history, 90% of your diagnosis is based off of history. We look at asking the right questions, verifying the information, and we know that most often times the woman is the gatekeeper of the family health history. You do not want to immediately assume that. You want to speak directly to your patient. However, understanding that dynamics that most of the women understand the family health history and know it much better. And usually women manage all of their family's health problems. They are the caregivers to ill family members, even if it's not their immediate family. So we look at the disease risk factor across the lifespan for all of these significant disease processes and understand that there's interactions between shared genes, behaviors, the cultures, the environments, and then understanding what is that best genetic test. What are the diagnostic tools that we have available to us that we can utilize? There was a precision medicine initiative that came out in 2015 that was due to sequencing of the human uh, genome. And there was a large data set with tools to improve technology for the analysis of this. And what was our goal? The goal is to understand disease prevention and treat, not be reactive, but we want to be proactive. We want to focus on disease prevention. Again, one of the disparities of health, we look at primary prevention, secondary prevention, and tertiary. This is your primary. How can we help prevent things? And then we go on to our secondary prevention where let's try to decrease the amount of reoccurrence of these issues. Taking a thorough family health history is important. Yes, time constraints are very significant. You know, we have a large patient population and you can be seeing three to four patients an hour, but understanding that an incomplete family health history can be detrimental to your patient because you might not identify things that are really important. Looking at that three generation, we talk about it in the soap notes, mom, dad, brother, sister, and then you look at maternal, paternal grandparents. This is why it's so important. There's so many tools out there to help with this. And this looks like 
looks at your risk assessment, your education, how you're going to manage these patients, and furthermore, if you go on with leadership and research. Looking at the graphics that can be there and understanding what the genotypes mean and how they are described and how we cover those generations, how those traits are passed and the incidents helps you understand the pedigree for that family and that patient that you're taking care of. And then the mnemonic of screen on knowing that some concern, do you have any concern about disease or condition that run in the family, reproduction, birth defects, infertility. This is especially important with family planning. Early disease, death and disability. Any of your family members have early age diseases or we say premature coronary artery disease. This is why it's so important. Looking at the ethnicity, what do you identify as? What country did you come from? What do you see as where your ancestors are from? And then non-genetic or not necessarily genetic, any non-medical conditions, risk factors, smoking, drinking, mental health issues, those things that are prevalent in the family. So briefly looking at the genetic disorders, we look at the monogenetic is when it's a single gene. Remember mono is single. Dominant, the mutation is on one allele. Recessive, the mutation is on both. X-link is confined to the X chromosome. When we look at chromosomal dis disorders, this is a change in the number or structure of the whole chromosome. Down syndrome, they have an extra chromosome. Prader-Willi, they have an absence, absence of a group of genes. And then we look at mosaicism, which is the altered chromosomal arrangement in some cells, but not all of them. These patients tend to have mild, milder symptoms. Prognosis tends to be better combination of genetic and environmental factors with like spina bifida, multifactorial disorders that tend to cluster in families. A lot of times it's population recurrence risk. Could it be exposure? Other things that have called genetic that have caused genetic abnormalities. Mitochondrial disorders. The mitochondria contains the 37 genes. It's usually maternal transmitted. Teterogens that we look at <clears throat> is an agent that can increase the incidence of congenital malformations okay we talk about radiation those different types of exposures this is where you can have the modification and ultimately have that congenital malformation and the genomic factors can significantly modify the effects of specific teratogens mendelial inheritance patterns we look at the autosomal dominant as well as the autosomal recessive. The dominant has an inherited single copy of the mutated gene. The risk is 50%. Pretty high, right? Usually the donating parent has the disorder. The recessive is two copies of the mutated genes, one from each parent. The offspring with only one copy are carriers. Carriers can pass this to their children, but sometimes themselves are unaffected. The risk is 25% for each child, 50% for risk of being a carrier, 25% to be unaffected. The X-linked dominant is a single abnormal gene on the X chromosome causing the disease. If the father is affected, the mother is not, all female offspring will inherit the disease. If the mother is affected, the father is not, there is a 50% chance that each daughter or son will inherit this. Why? because we have two X genes and we have an X and a Y, correct? So understanding that X links dominant is extremely important, right? Then the recessive usually occurs in males who only have one X chromosome. The mitochondrial inheritance is passed on by mothers. The codominant is two alleles for the gene that is expressed. And then we look at that genetic imprinting, the uniparental disomony, where you can have two copies of chromosome from one parent, not any from the other. You may have the disease, you may not have the disease. And these are non-traditional inheritance patterns. Epigenetics is the change in the gene function, but there's no change in the actual DNA. Chemical exposures, diet, endocrine disorders, maternal age. These are all the reasons why we have research going into this. 
What are the implications for a peds patient with this? We need to understand and do family health histories, look at those red flags, head to toe assessment, comprehensive history. And then this is a nice little box to help you understand the relationship and the example and how much genetic material is shared. So again, those red, factor, red flags that come into play, how many family members have this? Has it been an early age onset? Is it based off of ethnicity? Um, multifocal bilateral occurrence impaired organs, intellectual impairment, physical findings, growth problems, any congenital abnormalities, malformations, any specific syndromes, those neurological abnormalities, developmental delays, mental retardation, seizure disorder. Again, why a family health history is so important. And when we're looking at those diagnostic studies, screening is important, newborn screenings, we have the RUSP that looks at those conditions for screening. Prenatal, this is why we do genetic and congenital testing, as well as screening and education for parents. And then we have the diagnostic testing to confirm the diagnosis. You have the different genetic testings that are common with carrier testing and other testing. Just review what is the reason for them? What are we looking for? Carrier testing, we use it for family plan planning. You have other testing with pharmacological that looks at which drug would be best for each patient population. Primary care, understanding that if there's a positive family history, who do you refer out to? Primary care for children, if they are born with a genetic disorder, what is available for them in the community? What age appropriate guidelines do we need with these specific uh, abnormalities? And again, you have the ethical issues. Do you wanna know? Do you not wanna know? Do you have to warn them of these? And looking at the Genetic Information Non-Discriminatory Act, GINA, protects these individuals from misuse of genetic information. Again, you wanna make sure that they know, hey, we're keeping this confidential. You have a right to know. If you wanna know, then we will let you know, but you have to make sure you disclose that to your patients. And then references for your textbooks, readings, and additional resources.